Okay, welcome back. Hour number two. Time to say hello to Dr. Bill Deagle, who is on with us the second, uh, let's see, every Thursday, the first, third, and fourth Thursdays of each month, sometimes the fifth, he is on the middle hour here from 8 to 9 Pacific, and the second Thursday, he's on from 9 to 10 Pacific. He has created a a really remarkable document. Uh, it is uh, about Fukushima. It is entitled Environmental Catastrophe and Remediation Recommendations by Dr. Bill Deagle, MD, AAEM, ACAM, and A4M. This is uh, a very, very well done, very well thought out, uh, scientifically heavy article which completely traces the parameters of the catastrophe as we see them now, where they came from, where they're going. And, and Bill makes recommendations in here, which I haven't heard anywhere else. In fact, I've heard very few recommendations, frankly, because most of the time it seems that TEPCO not only doesn't know what it's doing, it doesn't want to know what it's doing. Bill, congratulations on this. It's uh, an enormous work. We have it in Data right under Bill's name in the guests section at rents dot com. Click on that and you'll you'll pull the paper up. It's in yeah, PDF no. format and that's easy. Okay. I want I want people also uh, give credit to Chris Harris. That's his radio name. That's our nuclear safety expert, who is one of the forty roughly uh, nuclear engineers that works not only here at the NRC in the United States, but also does contract work with recently Kepco, which is the Korean version of Tepco in uh, Korea, in South Korea. So. Uh, we, we've spent now three years basically going over this data, and I've become very familiar with the actual nuclear engineering design of the plant, the actual reasons for the failure, the the uh, sequence that actually triggered off the loss of the reactor core and reactor one, two, and three, mm-hmm. basically because they swamped the uh, the base backup fuel power systems that allowed the reactor to have the cooling. Uh, we had five other reactor sites in northern Japan that were actually struck with the same tsunami and earthquake. And they almost lost control, but they didn't. <clears throat> but if we have a large earthquake, it's very likely they'll lose control. Correct. <clears throat> now, so isn't it, have, isn't it, Bill, excuse me, but isn't it true that the plant director of operations saved this from being even worse by ordering oh, yeah. the, the reactors flooded? Now, TEPCO said, don't touch them, don't do anything. He, he overrode his bosses and ordered the reactors to be flooded with water, and that, that prevented a lot worse situation. Oh, yes, and, and not only that, he, I think he died recently. He did. Uh, because of his, his heroic efforts. He gave his life, yeah. <clears throat> right. <coughs> we have also a um, situation they call the Fukushima 50, which are a lot of the more, more senior engineers that basically went back and forth trying to do something. Now the site's so radioactive that no u- rational human being, even if they wanted to, could go in there and would probably become in- incoherent within 15 minutes and dead in an hour. So what the situation is now, and I try to go through, and I'll just kind of hit the high points of the paper, the first section is primary issues of the disaster. Um, firstly, they built all of these reactors, which are primarily Mark I boiling water reactor designs. They built them in Japan in tsunami and fault zones. And the one at Fukushima, <laughs> they actually tore down, it's true. They tore down the natural geography that would have prevented the swamping of the reactors. Correct. So yeah. they lowered it about 25 plus meters, which would have probably been enough to actually prevent it from ever losing control of the containment. They cut down the bluffs and created an enormous fill dirt pad upon which they put this wonderful gift to humanity. Right. And the other thing is that a fault line actually went right through the reactor one core, and there's numerous fault lines that uh, carry all over northern Japan. The fault line from Fukushima actually goes straight through to Mount Fuji. And so uh, several hundred kilometers away, Mount Fuji has now half-filled its uh, magma chamber, and about every 150 to 180 years, roughly, it blows. And when it does, it usually kills everything within 50 to 75 miles at least. Uh, and uh, it's likely to blow again relatively soon. I that mean, fault is time. connected right to Fuji. Wow. Right to Fukushima, yeah. Mm. Now, so when we look at this, we, these Mark, style, Mark I style boiler wiring reactors, there are at least 25 of them in the United States of 104 sites. And um, they haven't done basically anything. They, they did a little bit, they, they did a, what's called a faux. Um, uh, it was called Taurus uh, work in the one in Fukushima. They actually didn't do it with heavy steel with the proper designs. Uh-huh. So the initial engineering fight between this director you mentioned and the other staff was whether or not they should release the hydrogen early or late because they knew they actually didn't do a real engineering design. They did a full one, so it looked like they actually had 
something to capture the hydrogen from the the boiling water reactor. And so um, they tried to release it so they wouldn't have a hydrogen explosion that would cause them to lose containment. Um, in America, they actually have uh, you know the proper boiling water reactor hydrogen capture system, but the system the reactor has all so many fault designs. That even is, in 1972, they basically yeah. whistleblowers said that these yeah. designs should be never used. They One of the worst, it. most stupid things I have ever seen engineers devise. Right. You, you, you Plus, put, they also have, of course, the cooling pool and react, reactor materials on top of the reactor. It's it's so unbelievable. Cooling. Four yeah. stories up, the the bottom of the spent fuel pool begins and it rises up from there. This is nuts to put that right. stuff up there. Right. So, in other words, e even if you believe that there could be more reasonable or more recent designs. Uh, the problem is no reactor on Earth has ever been built except by public money. Uh, they can't make it financially on the actual value of the power that's generated. And if you generate 50 years of power and get, you know, 2 million years of having to deal with radioisotopes, it's not a good deal. It's a raw deal. So uh, basically nuclear power it t was raw in the first place, but the reason why it was worshipped is because it gave them the bomb. And right from the very start, Japan, even though they were restrained with their war re reparations and acts that they signed and a Marshall Plan to rebuild Japan, they uh, were restrained from building nuclear weapons, but behind the scenes the American government was collaborating and the, and the Israeli government took over about 50 years ago, collaborating with the Japanese to create right. uh, plutonium pellets for nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So when they couldn't get nuclear materials and they had trouble even during the Kennedy era, which is why Kennedy, one of the main reasons why Kennedy was assassinated is he tried to prevent the Israelis from getting the bomb. And well, he Japanese, demanded and he demanded inspections at Demona, and Ben Gurion said no, and Kennedy said yes, and Ben Gurion said no. Kennedy said yes, we're coming in, and that was certainly a key. That was the end of the game, yeah, and that was one of a number of enemies that Kennedy made, rather than just one. He made more oh, than yeah. one. There were half, he had half a dozen uh, people who yeah. wanted to kill him. Let me, if I may, take one minute here to uh, credit this hero. Uh, this man will be forgotten. He did just die of cancer. The former Fukushima supervisor of damage control uh, and so forth. His decision not to follow TEPCO's orders prevented Chernobyl-like explosions of uh, overheated Fukushima reactors uh, for a while. The uh, the gentleman's name is Masao Masao M A S A O Yoshida, and I want to commend yeah. him, even though he's no longer with us. He uh, he did a, a great thing there. Number of other people that are unknown, like the. Fukushima 50 and others. Yeah, they're right all now. It's yeah, basically, yeah. Yakuza uh, recruited basically novices, and unfortunately, homeless, I'm, homeless, Bill, homeless. Yeah, I'm going to go over actually a number of issues. They just had a problem with their cooling pool four, and apparently it was a backhoe that actually went through wires uh, controlling the cooling pool pumps. So it wasn't uh, rats like last year. They had a they had a pump system for the tanks, uh, and they believe it or not, it was rats on the site. And I said, you know, yeah. if they took a picture, they should have. Rats with green eyes and and uh, right. You well, know, they, we call and, them. Uh, uh, we call them. Little side on the side of the rat spray painted on them. I agree. We call them ratzilla here. Uh, yeah, right. nu nuclear rats. Nuclear rats. Well, the nuclear rats did bite through some wires on the back of trucks and pumps. They were right out in the elements, in the middle of winter and everything, and that's apparently where they had some troubles with some leakage last year uh, around all these different tanks. And by the way, the bottom rivets on many of the tanks weren't put on properly. So besides the fact that they're getting neutron annealing, which breaks down the steel and crystallizes right. it, they actually had improper manufacturing. Now all of those are filled, and they don't have space for new tanks. So the new policy is if they request that they need room for more water, they're they, going to just empty the tanks. Open, open the, the valve. Engine. Just open the valve and let her go. But the rivets, the, the bolts uh, weren't even tightened down all the way securely. Uh, right. This thing is just a one disaster after another. Right. And, 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 of course, the, the situation is they, they're also building an ice wall. They're starting to dig this week to build an ice wall. And it's not above the aquifer, above the Fukushima plant to prevent water from getting there. It's actually below it. So they're actually going to build a wall. And they have decided from their drill, their test drills, that they're going to have to build a wall 100 feet deep and freeze it. Now, of course, if you have hot corium hit that, it's like taking a hot poker and poking into a, into a large ice cube. It's going to burst. You're going to get what's called a burst effect. And that means you're going to have a, have a build up a lot of pressure. Then the hot quarry will eventually hit it. And when it does, you'll have a yeah. massive burst of radiation. And, of course, at the same time, it also turns the soil around the area to what's called a thixotropic. That's T-H-I-X-O-T-R-O-P-I-C, thixotropic uh, 
mush. Well, and that we, means mush. the thermometers on these towers, like cooling pool four and the common cooling pool, means they're going to tilt and eventually fall over. And exactly. when they fall over, and the other danger is, of course, with the seal for the cooling pool is, is weakening, which means when it finally it gives, there's no way that they're going to be able to pump enough water in there, and there's no secondary method for actually closing the seal off at the bottom of the cooling pool. What's happened is, is reactor number, a uh, number of these reactors, the actual ceiling fell in. They had cranes fall in, large steel girders, uh, you know, all kinds of horrors happened. So, well, it, it, uh, it's been a reactor, disaster yeah. after another. And the reason is that TEPCO is basically, if you want to call it, a management company and they subcontract engineers. They're not a, a, a you know, an advanced, you know, nuclear engineering company that has in place policies to, you know, to have automatic re, re, uh, remediation or uh, other technologies. It's only the heroic efforts of a few people here and there that have actually stopped it from being worse. Exactly so, right. So, right for the TEPCO for 40 years was an improperly a set of plants in a dangerous place with, uh, with basically a corporation that was marketing and trying to sell power and didn't want to put the money in to set up the proper, uh, <laughs> even they did it, even it was called faux engineering on the, yeah. on the Taurus. Very good. So, All right, uh, Bill, so we have to take a break here, Bill. Hold on, please. The uh, paper we're talking about by Dr. Deagle is available under his name in Guests. Uh, it's, it's a long paper full of illustrations, uh, very impressive, very important, and uh, hope you read it. Be right back. Okay, back with Bill talking about his uh, massive new paper, a uh, tremendous overview of the entire catastrophe. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, the... Um I try to give actually uh, imaginative and based on science uh, actual remediation technologies. So, mm -hmm. And I mentioned the two primary issues we have are the two dangers are water and neutrons. Uh, and the the first idea is to use Kevlar spider silk tents over each reactor site uh, and then over the whole facility and then to a uh, system, which we discussed today with uh, Chris Harris in the second half of the third hour, which uh, they have never got operational in two years, which is the... Uh, system to convert the radioactive waste to solid from the air and from the water so they can uh, remo be removed and not have, you know, many thousands of tons of radioactive waste. Uh, and uh, the next thing, of course, you need filtration systems. So you also need to have uh, stop the gamma neutron flux that's so intense that integrated circuits can't be used. So they, instead of using uh, a robot, which wouldn't exist either with the neutron flux or with the uh, electromagnetic vortex, because if you could actually see the vortex of electromagnetic fields around there, uh, when you have charged ions that are radioactive, you see literally dust devils of radiation and mm -hmm. of electromagnetic flux fields all over the place, and they would fry normal integrated circuits. So I'm familiar because of my classified exposure back in Colorado in the mid-90s that we make the I triple prom E Atmel chip that's a ferromagnetic chip that's totally uh, e uh, EMP-proof. And uh, because of the chip design also could be shielded with depleted uranium that would reduce the neutron flux and gamma ray effect on the integrated circuits in the crystal structure. Mm -hmm. The other is to make robots that would have literally no electronics and them would just be uh, air, uh, air air servos that would control the movement of the robots. What, pneumatic? Their, just... Pneumatic. Pneumatic robots and then use fiber optics for lighting and for... Mm -hmm and for visualization, mm -hmm. uh, so you can actually have a robot that basically is basically a totally yeah. pneumatic. Pneumatics or hydraulics, either one. Uh. Either one, and uh, you could do that, and each of them could have what's called a series of what's called ringed, uh, depleted uranium rings interlocking each other, so you could have, it, the color hoses could bend, uh, and, and so on, on the device, and also it could be as much as a mile away with the, with the workers inside mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. a container that's mocked up with, Many layers of depleted uranium because depleted uranium will stop only not only gamma rays but also uh, neutron flux. So I didn't know you that. can actually make them pretty radiation proof, and mm -hmm. you could have them with their own air filtration system, so that they would not be uh, fried if they're working so on this. So this thing. is wild. A, a radioactive element isotope uh, form DU is actually able to stop gamma and beta. Yes. Yeah, that's very fact, interesting. Uh, I didn't that, know that. That's why if you have a muon imaging system that looks at muons, uh, that's why they can see the shadow. You only see the shadow of the isotopes underground because of uranium and so on. They actually give a shadow of muons, can't go through them, so you see a shadow of them underground. Hmm. And um, so I'm using real science here when I give these recommendations. Uh, you also need a corium catcher. And uh, all the new radioactive isotope, uh, new radi reactors in America and around the world all have built into their design a corium catcher. They could build a corium catcher uh, using a uh, 
a uh, tunnel boring machine that would tunnel, let's say, I don't know, maybe four or 500 meters below ground, and they could create what's called a cupped uh, aquarium catcher, and then they would line it with containers, and then they would lock the containers together, again, lined with depleted uranium, and they would prevent the aquarium from going anywhere. So the real key is you've got to have a aquarium catcher, and then you have to have what's called a neutron flux uh, reducer, and that would be huh. hyperosmolar um, uh, bor- a borinated uh, solution. And then what you do is you dehydrate it using uh, microwaves and other technologies to, to flush out the water mm-hmm. as steam, and then the concentration of boron will go up and it will blab all the neutrons because as these isotopes in the aquarium boils underground, it's like a lava lamp. It's going to generate more what's called spontaneous neutron flux. Mm. And uh, if you uh, you can use what's called harmonic frequencies. In other words, you use the atomic frequencies that you get from something like the Hadron Collider. And they know from the collisions of isotopes that they can actually tune into the specific frequencies that would speed up the crystal formation. So you'd form giant crystals in a matter of hours rather than days or weeks or months. Mm. And uh, what it do, would do is block the neutron flux, and you create a crystalline sarcophagus for the for in, instead of trying to remove the fuel rods. Mm-hmm. Right now, I think there's about 340 out of 1,533 of the fuel rod assemblies in cooling pool four. Mm-hmm. Fold, but yeah. most of the rest of them are bent or the bent, broken, the fused. They can't get them out. Yeah, they easy. can't get them. And if they try to get them, they're likely to break the fuel rod assemblies and drop the pellets to the bottom. If the bottom, if you fuel pellets damage the what's called the the uh, containment seal, then they'll lose all the water, and then everything uh-huh. will go into a pyrophoric fire, and probably 80 to 90% will turn into a nanoparticle uh, array. And the problem is, is there's a danger, too, of what's called criticality, where you'll actually have nuclear explosions there, uh-huh. and some of them may be relatively small or relatively big, depending on how the corium is, is, is compressed, because uh, uh, you could have, and I think we, we're pretty certain that, that the MOX reactor 3 actually had a nuclear explosion that occurred that threw debris up to 65 kilometers away. Looked like a small A-bomb. Yeah, it was a small A-bomb. So what happens is this is going to inject it in the upper atmosphere, but it means you could have a massive release of tropospheric uh, nanoparticles. And it would include heavy isotopes like plutonium, um, thorium, uh, all of the really nasty, what's called uh, transuranic yeah. heavy metals, as well as... Uh, well, if it's, down to, if it's nano-sized, it'll stay up there for quite a while circle the globe. Actually, some of those materials exploded before the Second World War, before the Manhattan Project. They're still up there. They're still there, yeah. They're they're there after 60 years, so they're going to stay there for centuries. They're not going anywhere. They're they're going to stay up there. There's going to be a small amount come down, but most of it stays up. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we need to know where the aquarium is, and you can use muon, M-U-O-N, imaging. That's well uh, developed, and you can use also ground-penetrating radar. It doesn't need to be on the site where the the, uh, imaging would be destroyed. You can angle them at an angle and set a ring of these in an array and set up a computer model mm-hmm. to actually build a three-dimensional model where it is. So you can create a ring of of of, of uh, ground-penetrating radar, say, within a half a mile or so of the site, and then build a three-dimensional image of where the corium is. And with uh, there's a thing called neutron imaging, and the neutron imaging will actually tell you what the isotope is. So if you know where the location is in the neutron uh, pattern, you can actually tell what isotopes are present and which new ones are being made. Hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, international cooperation. Uh, Michio Kaku has talked about it, and many other scientists. Uh, it's to me, it's very bizarre that the scientists themselves haven't just called for, for a private NGO, international uh, consortium of scientists, Japanese, uh, French, Russian, and American are the lead nations in nuclear power, and they should be doing this. Especially the Russians are very good at low-tech solutions. Although the one they did, which is to send in about uh, eight hundred thousand Russians to do just a minimal exposure to radiation and drop a bunch of concrete. That sarcophagus five years ago became uh, non-functional, and right now it's leaking like crazy, inventing off radiation again. And uh, the Russians know that the cost to, to rebuild the sarcophagus is somewhere around $25 billion. And mm-hmm. neither the Ukraine, because this is in Belarusia, where it mm-hmm. was, Ukraine, which is downwind, uh, has the money or the will to decide to do this. And the current situation in Ukraine means that not only do they have the problem of the breakup of Ukraine into to two countries, which could happen, but also the danger that Chernobyl may actually re-release radiation. So Chernobyl yep. is, is yep. going downhill. Uh, this requires basically vigilance for many thousands of years. I've also listed here technology that I mentioned that is what I call sci-fi, but because I have access to advanced technologies, we do have what's called transmutational technology to transmute minerals and metals into other minerals and metals. And our technology is very advanced in this region, but it's all I call Warehouse 13. 
Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of technology yeah. that's literally in Warehouse 13 in our Black Op projects, but we don't release it because some of the technology is war weapons that are literally centuries ahead of our so-called uh, enemies and allies. Ultimately, and, science, if we still manage to stay around this planet long enough, we'll come up with ways to deal with this. But right now... Well, right uh, now, these other things would reduce it. Yeah. Probably, number one, they would reduce the chances of a nuclear explosion, venting off into the area and blocking the radiation. Mm -hmm. I mentioned also a seawall, which they should have. They should have a containment uh, barrier. Well, this, 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 this frozen seawall, people don't understand the basics of how water works. Water is the heavyweight champion. It'll go eventually where it wants to go. Though, yeah. That's yeah, right. The most, yeah, the most important thing, I think, above the site is to go maybe three or four miles up and build a giant uh, diversion project so the water doesn't get into the area. And mm -hmm. then you build a seawall below the plant mm -hmm. so that when the water gets through, because it's going to get through, sure it you is. then filter it, you filter it, and then you reduce the radioactivity to where it's insignificant. Uh, and good ideas. Very good ideas. Stand by. We'll come right back. Bill Deagle and his new paper here on this program, and you folks will... Learn more. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, and we're back talking to Bill about Fukushima. By the way, the interesting thing about uh, Reactor 3 spent fuel pool, as he mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of stuff fell in to that fuel pool. Right. Fif like 50 tons of material fell in there. Remember, nobody's been able to go into buildings 1, 2, or 3, and as Bill explained earlier, robots can't function in there, at least traditionally designed and built robots because they'll, they'll fry. So you got three more spent fuel pools, uh, and one of them, reactor threes, 50 tons of material, including the crane, fell in on the fuel rods. Now, you're going to yeah, tell they me they're not the bent and broken? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a mess. There's no way they're going to get those out of there. You're going to have to find a different way to do it. You also mentioned, Bill, something very interesting I hadn't heard much about, that the seal at the bottom of Reactor 4's spent fuel pool is beginning to rot away or give way. Tell me more about that seal. What's it look the, like? The seal basically is just a seal between the bottom of the pool and the sidewalls, and there's three reasons why it can fail. The first is just time uh -huh. uh, combined with neutron flux, which causes kneeling of the crystal structure. The second is the subsidence of the building, which tw twists the superstructure of the whole building. So and that building has subsided 31 inches so, already on right. one side. Right, so it can twist away from the seals, which can cause it to leak, and there's no ah. amount of pumping water in that could stop that. Right. Uh, and the third reason is that there could be degradation from the debris that falls and it hits the seal, or from small explosions, either uh -huh. hydrogen or criticality yeah. nuclear yeah. explosion. Ah, so at the bottom of that pool, we, we strongly suspect, we can virtually bet on it, that there are a lot of broken pieces of fuel rods uh, sitting together, on the bottom, and they're not going to send they, Navy SEALs down there to pick them up and pull them out. So. Right, and there's likely to be uh, more debris down there since they've been pulling their up to about 340-plus uh, uh, fuel rod assemblies they pulled. Yeah. Most likely, this, some of the later ones are actually twisted, so when they remove them, many of the pellets or pieces of the fuel rod assemblies and the zirconium actually uh, degraded and fell in there. Uh -huh. There's two problems when you have the zirconium cladding uh, fall in there. It generates hydrogen and tritium. And the tritium, of course, is because it's getting neutron fluxes or hitting water and turning it into deuterium, which is, uh, you know, a has extra neutrons, and, uh, and tritium, which has three neutrons. It's heavy water. And heavy water slows neutrons, so it actually increases the chances of criticality. So the more tritium you get in the water, the more chances of a hydrogen or tritium explosion, and you also have uh, more chances of a criticality or a nuclear explosion because it increases the chances of a chain reaction. So wow. all these are bad things. Wow. All bad yeah. Well, the yep. chances of Reactor 4 spent fuel pool falling at any given time, any time, are certainly not uh, negligible. Well, the, They're there. The They're big. That, the calculation the Japanese did uh, is that the chances of a level 7 earthquake are greater, which will cause 
most of the buildings in the area to deteriorate and fall in is about 90% in the next two years. So it's wow. a virtual guarantee that in the next two years they're going to have a catastrophe there, even if there's not annealing or leakage or a criticality reaction or the corium finally explodes 25 or 35 meters down because it's now 25 meters below ground. Um, so we're, we're likely to have one or more different what I call burps of radiation that are very big. Um, the biggest problem they have right now is they don't have even enough storage place for the current technique, which is they don't have, and I'm going to pull up the document here, they don't have this 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 system for actually it's called a I think it's called APLS uh, and I'll I'll pull it up from my report today and I'll be able to tell you this specifically but uh, we went over it with with uh, Chris uh, specifically today about this system uh-huh. and there's a number of points here that people should understand some of them are technical but they'll explain to you if you have journalists out there that want to know why this is so dangerous and why uh, this is only going to go south. Uh, you know, there's doing nothing to, at all to stop it. Nothing inventive, nothing, nothing creative, nothing, uh, nothing out of the box. Uh, not spending any money. Uh, the first thing is loss of control of the ALPS, which is the Advanced Liquid Processing System, uh, and not up and running. They've been trying for over two years. Reactor four cooling pool. They had some sloppy work, so they literally hit it with an excavating backhoe and hit the wires. So the, they had for four and a half hours. This is this week. They lost mm. control of the pumps for the no, cooling pool. Floor. No cooling. Yeah, no yeah. cooling. And then, of course, they started digging in the ice wall, which is basically to dig, dig down 100 feet into this mush, and they're going to start putting this this ice wall up, which is going to actually massively increase the amount of water that's going to build up behind this wall until finally you're going to get a burst reaction when hot corium strikes the wall, and then eventually it bursts. Yeah. So that means yeah. they're going to build up a reserve of highly radioactive water, and at some point it's going to burst. And then the other major problem, they had 100 tons leakage this week, but they basically, it turns out that all of the storage containers, which are improperly put together in the first place, like the old story between the husband and wife, uh, dear, you must read the instructions before you put it together. They didn't mm-hmm. read the instructions. Mm-hmm. So uh, now they have to actually have the field workers release water to actually have a place to put the new radioactive water because they don't have room for new tanks. Okay, no so more tanks. They did no admit that uh, somebody apparently opened the valve when they had that 100-ton uh, leak about a week ago. Well, I think they're calling one of the tanks. Actually, on the ground, my guess is it wasn't a leak, but actually someone on the on the field crew was told that you oh, must open the find valve. a place to put the water. That was my guess. Yeah. You must find a place to put the water. And he said, well, I don't have any place to put it, so he just pulled the valve and let it leak, so he had a place to put the new radioactive water. Because remember... These people are working off debts right. to the Yakuza, and they have lead-covered uh, dosimetry cards. So basically, if they don't follow orders, including stay in the site that long after their radioactive uh, dosimetry cards black, yep. uh, they they basically die a, a vicious death at the hands of the Yakuza. They got homeless people in there. They're picking up a lot of the dregs. Uh, these people are obviously sacrificial, and they are being sacrificed. But uh, co- quite right about everything you've said. Uh, it's all in your report. Bill's report, again, available right under his name in guests at rents.com. Yeah, and the other thing is I mentioned uh, the possible alternatives with nuclear fusion energy, and I show, uh, because I took care of employees working at the U.S. Space Command, I had direct access to some of the most classified material on our off-world space projects, including our helium-3 mining on the moon. We do have tokamak reactors and have had them for over 50 years. Uh, they have been miniaturized, too, so there's no need for us to have a problem. We have energy for the vacuum. We've had many discussions with Professor McCanny on the entire physical physics model of energy from the, what's called the plasma of the uh, you know, of interstellar space and interplanetary space. There's limitless energy out there, like Tesla talked about that. We have geothermal energy. We have wind, wave, and tidal energy. We've got decentralized power generation that should have been started ages ago. And we also know that the... Uh, you know, the power grid is completely un- incapable with the NERC trial last November of even withstanding the uh, re- the load put, say, in California of putting wind and solar on it because it can't t- tolerate the, the transient surges of power. So our current grid is not even capable of handling the surges from domestic power production just by wind and solar. So, uh, in other words, we're, we're also, by the way, putting it online, which means it opens it wider to cyber terrorism. So we take off the, the blue army in Tianjin, China, that's their cybernetic army, or in Iran or anywhere else, like the Russian uh, cybernetic uh, forces. They can easily hack into a more advanced, let's say, smart meter type system and tear down our backup power for our nuclear reactors, shut off our grid. And they also don't just shut them off, they actually destroy equipment, which 
By the way, all of our new power, step down power transformers, etc., are all manufactured now in China. We have no manufacturing facilities in North America <laughs> at all. Oh, China. too funny. You don't yeah. think they've built in any uh, back doors in there, do you? Uh, oh, man. <clears throat> no, so. Unreal. It's very bizarre. By the way, all the chips that the Chinese have manufactured for, they have a back door and they figured out what's called the, the duty frequencies, so they, they know how to shut down the duty frequencies of all the chips and all the carriers. Mm -hmm. Things like onboard power in these carrier groups. And all, and eighty five percent of the chips come from uh, from China and Taiwan. Wow! All right, stand by a second. We'll take a break and come right back. Something to think about with Doctor Bill Deagle. Okay, back to Dr. Bill Deagle. A prodigious accomplishment with this paper. It is uh, extraordinary in its scope and breadth and length, and certainly the accuracy of the information is second to none. Uh, and if you have been following us on this program for any length of time, you'll know that there has yet to be a single, at least publicly announced, publicly known, meeting, get-together, confab of the world's top nuclear physicists, engineers, and so forth. There is no obvious collusion going on between these people to try to come up with a solution. Well, so here it is in the paper. Into, maybe this will embarrass them into showing up. Maybe. You've got a lot of good ideas here. Uh, what, well, and, I and think I they, them, by the way, if they're nuclear physicists out there, and I do have them to listen to the show and contact me, uh, challenge me to prove that I'm wrong or that these ideas have got validity, I don't see anything being done. No. And nothing. I also don't want to throw human beings in there like cannon fodder to the radiation. Well, they're doing I think it. They can use create, I think they can reuse creative uh, regimes. I also have a protocol up there for for radiation detox and for uh, remediation and for DNA repair because uh -huh. we can't do those things. And uh, you mentioned last time, and I have a tendency to, to talk too fast, which is one of my faults, or to get too technical, but I wanted to concentrate on just uh, two of the major nutraceuticals here, and the first one I want to mention is Nutritrala, uh, the only long-acting alpha-lipoic acid in the world. And uh, now, ALA, alpha-lipoic yeah. acid, is important for what? Tell our listeners. Well, normal alpha lipoic acid has a half life of 28, 27 minutes, which means it's gone pretty quickly within an That's hour. That's it. So if you take your ALA in the morning, folks, it's gone in a half an hour. Well, uh, half of it's gone in twenty seven minutes. In, I understand. But another half is gone another twenty seven minutes. So in fifty four minutes, basically, it's down to a quarter. An hour, you zip. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you want to have long acting. This is a half life of eighty four minutes, which means it's going to it's going to last eight to twelve hours. And if you take one uh, two to three times a day, it recycles your vitamin C, your vitamin E, all of your mm -hmm. antioxidants, both fat and water soluble. Mm -hmm. Because this is how radiation works. Radiation works by stripping electrons from your tissue, and air electrons being stripped from tissue makes tissue acid. So if you have to think of acidity as basically electron deficient tissue. So uh, when you want to pump up electron deficiency, the other thing we have is power C, which is the only neutral pH mixed mineral ascorbate vitamin C in the world. And it's calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, ascorbate with bioperin, which is a black pepper extract. So these are the first two I'd like to talk about tonight, because if you get these two, you're well on your way to protecting yourself. Okay, and the because second one was? Power C+. Plus, power okay. C+. Plus. Very good. So now neutral is really important, because if you can simply recycle to get rid of free radicals, which free radicals destroy or strip electrons, mm -hmm. and you can recharge your uh, cytochromes and your cellular membranes with electrons, you can maintain what's called a transmembrane potential, which basically is just an ion potential across every tissue. So if you use a bioimpedance machine or get one of these scales that measures your body mass and your lean body mass, it's basically just a bioimpedance device that fractionates the tissues and knows if it's fat or muscle, lean body mass, etc. That's all it's bioimpedance. So um, what you're trying to do is you're, you know, like Linus Pauling visualized this idea of a machine called a field ion scanner. And three years ago, I came up with the idea and shared it with a radiologist in Los Angeles. So I know how to build one of Linus Pauling's field ion scanners. Mm. They could actually see the ion concentration and give you a color scale identification of the specific molecular structure in four-dimensional space. So you can really? actually... Really? Wow. Yeah. So I know how to build that. Yeah. And I haven't shared it because I know my idea is stolen, but I know how to do it. So if anybody's out there and, and wants me to help them develop the field ion scanner, you could do it. You could actually see metabolic processes in four-dimensional space in the human body, in their liver or their brain, wow. as metabolic reactions are occurring. Mm -hmm. 
So what happens is if you just take these two, they're going to dramatically help you. The next thing that happens is you get decrease in what's called the NK or natural killer cells. So most people that are going to die from radiation are not going to die of cancer. They don't live that long. They're going to die, number one, of super infection. If they get a heavy enough dose, they're going to do cerebral edema, and basically their brain will start swelling, and they'll end up with cerebral edema that will cause them to cone their brains through the frame and magnum. It's like shoving an ice cream cone through a hole in the bottom of your sink. Terrific. And very painful, very awful, horrible way to die. And if you reduce brain edema by using these things and you take Nutri-Defense, which keeps your natural killer cells, you won't also die of the next thing, which a lower dosage of radiation will get you, which is walking around and getting horrible infections because all the bugs needed to digest you and eat you are waiting in the wings. And sometimes they don't wait until you die. They start to chew away at you before then. Stealth infections, which start cancer, <laughs> vascular exactly. disease, which is yeah. nanobacteria. So after people drank the black rain in uh, Japan after, Fukush after Nagasaki and Hiroshima, which are giant raindrops of black, they ended up basically walking around getting gas gangrene, pneumonia, sinus infections, and osteomyelitis, uh, you know, uh, cerebral infections, etc. You know, they ended up with breakdowns in tissue because the acidity came so high, they burst their bowel. They had diverticular attacks where they get a massive mex toxic megacolon. Mm-hmm. And so if you simply keep your NK killer cell activity up, you're going to help a lot. And then, of course, the next thing to take to stop free radicals is called cell detox glutathione. And this is stronger than what we used to give at our hyperbaric clinic in Denver where we used three atmosphere, 100% oxygen, and give intravenous glutathione because it's the acetyl form. And the acetyl form will last for 12 hours or more. And the acetylated form also will penetrate the brain, blood-brain barrier, liver, heart, kidneys. Uh, and we use another product called Regenerex, and it has uh, particular forms of curcumin and other nutraceuticals, so it grabs heavy isotopes, including lead, mercury, uh, arsenic, etc., and in immobilizes it so that even if you have a previous load in your body, it prevents those from becoming toxic. So um, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically reduce the effect of the radiation on the body and rescue it. Uh, another product we carry is called Nutriodine, which is the, the only source Tesla-activated diatomic iodine. And it's put through a very powerful Tesla field to activate the into plasma form of diatomic iodine, which your thyroid gland makes, but then has to export all over the body. So the thyroid is not just exporting T4 and T3, it's exporting diatomic iodine. And there's a very limited capacity to make it. If you have diatomic iodine, it has three properties. It makes new mitochondria. Mm -hmm. It rescues your cells from mitochondriopathy and mitochondrial death, and which can trigger off apoptosis of cells. And it also kills all pathogens. So nitriodine we use in our missionaries for killing malaria, cerebral malaria, uh, AIDS, uh, cancer, um, virtually any pathogen you can think of, from chicken conga to to spirochetes, to, you know, leptospirosis. It'll so bacterial, up. viral, it doesn't matter. This, Any pathogen you can them. imagine. This, mm -hmm. It also coats the phospholipid layer of all your cells so those pathogens can't enter. So uh, <clears throat> these are very powerful nutraceuticals. We use those, for example, in people with AIDS or hepatitis, and we can drop their viral load without a given, I call it triple threat. Mm -hmm. We have the only ionic uh, stabilized silver citrate complex, which is in a totally ionic state, not nanoparticle or colloidal which are dangerous because they're going to bioaccumulate. This is a totally in the ionic state, so it transitions across the gut wall, the splanchnic circulation in the gut and the liver. It goes to the target organs in a stabilized complex, and then we have the most powerful form of, of, of I call of allicin. I get a German source now, so I've stepped it up from the uh, other sources which are out there, which are really good, but they're more expensive, uh, called Al allicin, uh, Alamax and Alamed. We've got one called Allison Med that I've got uh, from uh, Germany. And uh, so they have a very good source. And I have immunoglobulins, Immunomax and Nutrimmune. And our immunoglobulins will modulate your immune system so you don't get a massive cytokine storm. Because when people are exposed to radiation, you go into a state of uh, fight or flight, and your body starts to dump cytokines, and you get a massive surge of tumor necrosis factor alpha, IFN, gamma, uh, interleukine 2, and uh, IL-1 beta, et cetera. And they can start to destroy tissues and puncture holes in the cell walls. Mm -hmm. And you have to pull out the heavy metals, so we use things like our Keeler Max and the only form of non acid wash zeolite called Ultra Zeolite. And the Keeler Max is a number of things that will actually safely get into your body, your bloodstream, and actually grab the heavy metals and pull them out, and as well as the ultra liquid zeolite. So we didn't want it was one of those acid wash because it changes the crystal structure of the aluminum cage, which is made when seawater strikes volcanic magma. So you have to have a source of volcanic magma that doesn't have radioisotopes or heavy metals in it so that when the zeolite cages are made, you don't have to wash them with acid and change their structure. Mm. 
So uh, it, okay. it's also been found by Dr. Z- uh, Dr. Asaf Jarakovich, who's a triple board specialist, but on our program shortly after uh, the Fukushima problem. Mm-hmm. He's an Amer- worked in the American military. Discovered 25 years ago, if you use a probiotic, like we have the Rizal 6 strain, living probiotic, and the most powerful one in the world called the Living Probiotic Ultra, the How Are You strain. So powerful to even prevent cholera, even if you take a month or two before you go to Haiti. The Howard uh, Hughes it, strain? It's called, it's called How Are You, H-O-W-A-R-U. I'm it's just kidding. U. It's actually a special strain that, that is the most powerful probiotic hmm. on the planet. The how does it get, how does it get past the stomach acid? It gets past, it'll get past anything. There's nothing that can stop it. It's like the Delta Force hmm. probiotic. And mm-hmm. they... The regular one we carry is called the Rizal 6 strain, which I take regularly. But if I have a, a bowel, serious bowel problem, and uh, then the How Are You strain, you only need it every third day for the How Are You, but the regular probiotic take at least one or two a day. How are you? Uh, we, That's good. Yeah, yeah. so that gives an, a kind of a, a view of the of the uh, core. Now, if we will, people look, read this paper and they want to contact me, uh, I'll give them more detail on the more advanced things like remineralizing your body. Uh-huh. It's incredibly important to get the minerals into your body so the radioisotopes don't have a place to go. Uh, remember, all these radioisotopes are highly charged molecules, so they get absorbed faster than regular minerals. So if you're calcium deficient or magnesium, you're going to suck up uh, strontium-90 way faster than the person who's got adequate stores in your body. And uh, SR-90 is, is the big one now that is being emitted into the ocean. It's t- taken right. three years, and there was a model, as I mentioned, 1991, which predicted exactly right. how long it would take in a right. meltdown next to the ocean, and that's and what's happened if here. If you're taking chelating agents, though, which, because of their electrical charge, grabs them quicker than regular minerals. Uh-huh. Uh, you, you don't. We won't bioaccumulate them. The problem is that they they get pushed by the cilia if you are not a smoker from your lungs into your uh, GI tract, about a mm-hmm. liter and a half of mucus every day. And uh, if you're taking probiotics and these chelating agents, you won't bioaccumulate hardly any of it. So you know when people are all freaked out by it, the main thing is treat the uh, your home like a hazmat facility. Uh, go to our website, Nutramedical.com, and, and go through the link to uh, Less EMF and get a data logging radiation detector. Uh, I like I have an Inspector Plus, or you can get an Inspector EXP with a little arm, so if you go to the fish counter. Yeah. But the data logging one is nice because you can actually hook it up to your computer and then use Jeff's system to become a data logging site, and then you can actually post it up on your, your website and your GPS location. Well, so we, we uh, hope to get more, and we've got one up there now, thanks to David. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing because we citizens yeah. have to do it because the dang government's not going to do it. Not going to do anything. Uh, that mass of water, the toxic radioactive water, is expected to reach here anywhere in uh, two to four months now. It's not here yet. What's what's being picked up are advanced pieces, so right. to speak, of the toxic pollution. Right. And, and, so and you're the first to pick up on it that the blocking highs are out there in the ocean to prevent the highly radioactive. I rains. believe it. Our, our rain is only non-radioactive as we hit it the last few days. Yep. It's coming from the South Pacific, but uh, yeah. they're not letting any North Pacific. So no, that's the expect- Pineapple Express. They won't let the North Pacific storms down. They didn't. They shut them off. I think they had a yeah. decision to make. Do we buy some time and shut off the storms and the radiation and have a drought, or do we let the radiation come in and pour down all over everybody? And right. I, what happens is they had a few radiation sickness. You're going to get an angry, violent population oh, and yeah. civil disruption. Everybody with a Geiger counter is going to be reading it everywhere. Yeah. Okay, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Bill, thank you. And again, I uh, commend you on the paper. It's wonderful. I'm going to go through it in more detail later. It is up there. It has dialogue, too, with Chris Harris, yeah. so people see the emails back and forth. Excellent. Now we got up on the News, et cetera. Yeah, excellent. Very good. Okay, talk to you soon. Thanks much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Take care, everybody, and take action. Okay. Good night, Bill.